good morning to um, everybody. Um, the, the topic that I'm going to uh, speak to this morning is using wilderness medicine to take joy in, in medicine in general. Um, and I want to thank you for letting me meet with you about this topic because it's um, especially near and dear to me um, now that we're coming together at the same time that we're sheltering from one another. Um, I was originally going to speak to you about the intersection of wilderness medicine and disaster medicine, but you were granted a reprieve when I asked to switch topics. Um, that happened because a little more than a month ago, uh, I had a large glioblastoma uh, removed from my uh, right frontal lobe, which based on my behavior, my daughter thinks might have um, been there for um, 60 years. Um, and I'm going to take the uh, opportunity now to um, speak to you about this because I need to take it one opportunity at a time. Um, and this meeting seems like the right time to try and round the bases, even if I don't hit the ball out of the park. Uh, I'm sure that many people attending this session are old friends, and I hope that they'll join new WMS members in chiming in so we can use this opening session to set uh, a tone of appreciation, enthusiasm, um, and inspiration um, for everybody. You all know what wilderness medicine is from medical and scientific perspectives. Um, in many of the sessions at this meeting, you're going to learn facts, techniques, and opinions that will make you people of action. Um, I want to do something slightly different. Um, I want to give you a framework upon which you can, if you choose, um, structure um, a life. You all know what wilderness medicine is um, from a medical and scientific perspective. Um, in, in many of the sessions at this meeting and in all of our meetings, you learn a lot of facts, techniques, and opinions that make you people of action. Um, I'm, I'm wanting to do something different. Um, um, I'm wanting to try and provide a framework uh, upon which you can, if you choose, structure a lifelong learning process that enriches you um, the people that you serve and the specialty that brought you to this, to this meeting. Um, I get a lot of credit for wilderness medicine, but that's not fair. Um, I'm just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there are too many people to mention um, who have done and are doing spectacular things, whether or not they're in the limelight. Um, if any of the following names aren't familiar to you, um, please take some time and, and learn about these folks. Um, Brownie Shaney, Ed Gear, Ken Kaiser, Peter Hackett, Howard Backer, Jeff Tabin, Gord Giesbrecht, Mel Otten, and, and Lou Ann Freer. The, there are many, many others, and many of them are on, are on this call. The modern history of wilderness medicine and the history of the WMS are populated with people of science, integrity, innovation, and most important, um, bravery, uh, compassion, and fun. Um, when I look back at my career and why I became a doctor, it was the last three that were most important at the beginning, um, and they're the most important um, at the end. But given the current shifts to corporatizing medicine, measuring everything through the lens of customer satisfaction and the pressure upon doctors above and beyond everything to be productive and profitable, um, we face computer screens and electronic medical records when we should be facing patients. We cut visits short so that our average time to see a patient continues to drop. And too often we come home at the end of the day saddened by spiritual fatigue. <clears throat> How can we take back what is rightfully ours? How can we once again become fascinated and happy? I think wilderness medicine can really help. Um, what do we need? Uh, we need happiness measured in hugs, handshakes, and smiles. If you can reach um, that far, um, pat yourself on the back. Um, a sense of newness and wonder. If the medicine um, in wilderness medicine doesn't do it for you, then surely the wilderness can. Um, we need a learning environment. I know a lot of wilderness medicine, but I'm always learning. Um, discovery. A great day for me is not my press Ganey score. Um, it's when I figured out something or spotted the finding that got by everybody else. 
companions and friends, mates, respect, love. Wilderness medicine is about teams, socializing, rescues, recreation, and creating um, safety. Um, days in the wilderness, or at the very least outside, um, climb, dive, ski, trek, bike, kayak, explore. Um, and take the time to savor at least one thing every day. Um, use 30 seconds to simply soak it in. Study the WMS and think about how you might contribute. Um, think big, but don't hesitate to start small. Um, become a learner, a teacher, an instructor, a coach, a project participant, a committee member. At the next in-person meeting, round up a bunch of folks with similar interests and, and go for a hike or gather for a meal. When we, when we first began the WMS, we filled the big gap. Um, now we're filling other gaps. I think we can be more bold on certain issues. Um, in the beginning, we avoided advocacy, politics, taking sides, and anything that could be construed as overstepping our expertise. It was strictly about the medicine. Uh, I think we've matured past that. Um, there are global concerns about our environment and human rights for which we must be informed and develop opinions. The WMS should not be afraid to take a stand on matters that concern our members and that will have direct impact upon the future and well being of wilderness medicine and wilderness medicine. We can tolerate differences of opinion within our ranks, within our ranks without acrimony. So, what next? Um, Abe Lincoln said, I am a slow walker, but I never walk back. Um, that's me now. Um, forward slowly until I kneel. If I see you all in front of me, I hope to walk for a while longer. You be the leaders and I'm going to be a follower. Finally, here's a quote from Lawrence Pearsall Jacks. A master in the art of living draws no sharp distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his education and recreation. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence in whatever he is doing and leaves others to decide whether he's working or playing. To himself, he's always doing both. Um, so thank you for letting me um, lead off with these um, comments. I hope that they're um, useful to some folks. And uh, I think for the uh, rest of the session, um, I'd, I'd like to respond um, to any questions or comments. And um, I think you should feel free to have a dialogue amongst yourselves um, as well, because that's what uh, this meeting is all about. So thank you. So we have a few questions that have come up already. One of the first ones that I think is quite pertinent is what kind of advice might you have given yourself five to 10 years ago? Can you just uh, repeat that for me a little bit? What advice might you have given yourself five to 10 years ago? Um, five, 10 years ago. Uh, well, this, I don't want this to send the wrong message. Maybe to make uh, a little more time for myself. Um, I have always been a hard worker and uh, driven. And um, I think uh, if I could turn back the clock, um, all the little things that I was so uh, obsessed with getting perfectly right, um, I think I would have um, let them just fall where they are and uh, spent more time, uh, more, more time, doing some of the things I love that were recreational. Um, but I don't, by the same token, I don't regret that um, because in, in doing that, um, I was able to surround myself with, you know, all the wonderful people um, that are part of the WMS um, and who have made such incredible contributions um, to this specialty, which we started. So, um, that take the time for yourself. Um, you know, we show yourself some compassion. Um, that would be the advice that I would give people. 
And I think that's an amazing thing for everybody to remember is take time for themselves. And your quote right there, show yourself some compassion, is something that many of us in this field of medicine don't do. We care so many for other, so much for other people, but not for ourselves. So another question that came up, and this has to do with your experience working with the Uniformed Services University. And do you feel that junior officers are being given enough training in austere and remote environmental medicine, or is there something that could be changed? Um, one of the, the great joys that I've had over the past um, decade, um, but even longer than that, only because it's intensified over the last 10 years, is being able to support and work with the military at, at all levels. And the Uniformed Services University, which is America's medical school, um, is an astounding uh, and remarkable place. Um, these are young men and women from all services who um, are training to be doctors, have every expectation that they'll be deployed into um, dangerous situations. And um, they are uh, almost to a person, uh, humble, hardworking, um, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, um, uh, achieving, um, and, um, uh, selfless. And so the question was, um, are they getting the training they need to deploy into remote environments? Um, I would say they're getting part of the way there. Um, you can't be good in tough situations and environmental situations without actually being there. So they don't have time during their uh, four-year curriculum to actually go and be uh, deployed in the mountains or be deployed um, in, you know, in a, in a uh, aquatic unit. Um, that, um, they may have done that before they even get into medical school. Um, they get that through the military part of it, but not really through the medical training that they get. So, you know, we can always do better. Um, I don't think it's a, uh, a huge flaw that I've seen that's been, been pointed out. We, uh, I've been fortunate enough to participate in the Bushmaster exercise, uh, which is a simulated four days uh, in, in the field uh, that's held at Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. Um, and they do really well. Um, uh, that, you know, they come in, some of them pretty green, um, and in, a, in the course of four days, they, they're they converted into functional operating medical units. It may be the most, uh, maybe the closest thing they get to what they're going to face uh, through their four years. And uh, so you can always use more of that. It's just a question of where do you fit it in? Um, and um, so, uh, that, that I, I think they do uh, a whole lot better than we do in regular medical school. So, you know, in, in a standard, uh, non-military medical school environment, um, I think the students crave practical experiences, uh, and they love to go on site where they can, uh, attempt to be providers. And, um, you know, I think the more, rugged we can make those experiences uh, and more realistic they are the better prepared they're going to be uh, for uh, whatever assignments they take on in the future I, I hope that answers the question if it doesn't um, let me know and i'll try again i think that it was was excellent so a very pertinent question given these times is what advice or thoughts do you have for maintaining perspective during these times of transition, both professional and personal, and when the unknown is the only known? Yeah, it's a tough time for everybody. Um, the, the virus situation has turned everything upside down. And I think the biggest thing it's, it's done is, in some ways, it's pulled us together, but in many ways, it's pulled us apart. Um, and uh, there is a lot that's not known. And so we're, we're guilty, I guess, of moving from, uh, from knowledge-based 
estimations of what might be good for the general population and individuals to panic-based decisions. And over time, we'll learn what was right and, and what was wrong. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, uncertainty is part of life. Uh, I mean, I'm becoming a case study and, and the, you know, you just, you step back, you figure out what you think you have and you, you deal with it. And um, I think now um, we don't know what the new quote unquote normal is going to be. Um, the, everybody hears the word normal and so they assume that we're going to go back to doing things precisely the way we did them before. And while that would be terrific for many of those things, um, it might not be the best thing to do uh, and might not have been the best thing to do before the pandemic. So um, I think this is a great time, you know, when you pull back and you have the opportunity to ease into whatever is coming next, this is a great opportunity to look at, you know, the best possible ways to emerge from this particular um, sheltering in place and, and hunkering down and, um, you know, should, we should look at every environmental uh, issue that we've put on hold and decide where, where do we want to be? You know, how do we emerge and point ourselves towards the right direction, whatever that is. Um, and there'll be plenty of discussion about what that is. Um, um, to the extent that the general population can depoliticize all these issues, because uh, the politicians aren't going to depoliticize them. Um, we we should get our best minds together and say, you know, this seems to be right. This seems to be wrong. And this is what we don't know. And let's see if we can figure out what to do. So I'm, um, I'm embracing the uncertainty as an opportunity to try and come forward with rational ways to do things. Um, and whether that be, what's safe for mass gatherings, you know, how many people can you put in a football stadium and, you know, not wipe out the community? Um, you know, what, what, what are the things that we should be weighing in on? But uh, I, I'd urge us to do that first for the things that are important to wilderness uh, medicine, if, if this is going to be a challenge for the Wilderness Medical Society. Uh, and I would consider us to have a broader platform than just um, just how do we want to care for people uh, medically in those environments? Is there anything different about what we're going to do um, uh, and adapt to the reality of, of what we have? The ski patrol is doing that already. And so there, you know, we, we communicate frequently about what's the best way to, um, if the end goal is to get people back up on skis and let them enjoy the outdoors, um, you know, I'm, I'm just praying that I can, you know, stand up on some skis sometime this winter. I don't care if I go a distance of 20 yards on a flat surface. I just want to be on them and get out there. Um, the, you know, we should, we should look at those things and try and help people that are trying to make good decisions and uh, wade into those uncertainties and try and provide some, you know, expert guidance and some certainty. That's uh, it leads very well into the next question that came up and um, a concern about wilderness medicine electives for PA nurse physician education. And I'm going to take this outside the scenario of COVID and What's your feeling on having real patient contacts, if possible, beyond just the didactic and scenario curriculum? And are they necessary for an elective to be considered valid? Or the construction of scenarios, does that help to keep this valid? Um, I think we have a lot that we need to look at 
um, going forward with medical education and this new environment of distancing ourselves from patients. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm seeing a lot of young house officers and medical students getting very good at interviewing iPads. Um, I, you know, uh, I get it. I mean, I, I understand, you know, that everybody's trying to figure out how to keep people from getting sick. But there's a loss of education in that process. Um, all of us, um, and I would, I would say all of us on this call, um, have had an expectation and an experience of uh, physically examining patients, understanding, you know, what it means to touch a hot belly or um, make diagnoses by pulling down somebody's um, lower eyelid and looking at their conjunctiva and, and all the things that we do to make, uh, to make the interaction um, teach us how to get um, to diagnoses and be able to help patients. So let's assume that we have to diminish some of that for reasons of personal hygiene and not catching a communicable disease. That may be the right thing to do. I don't know for that particular purpose, but um, it's, um, it's taking away uh, essential contact time that young people need to be able to learn how to be complete clinicians. And that has implications for medical education. And, and that's, uh, that would go across the board. Um, and that would be, um, that would be, uh, doctors, nurses, anybody who's a health professional, uh, if you, you can't touch people and you can't get close to people, you lose the educational component of what you would have gained by being able to do those things. So does that mean that we need to lengthen the periods of training? Um, should we, you know, if, if you, I'm just going to pick a number out of thin air, but if you to diminish your patient contacts by 50%. What's the critical threshold at which you're not getting enough patient contact to go out and be safe or productive uh, in a clinical environment? Does that mean that you need to double the length of your residency? I mean, I'm sure I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, my chat box is probably going to blow up here in a second, but the, you know, the, you know, we have to look at um, some of the quantitative things um, not make quick, um, you know, quick decisions, but just start accumulating the evidence um, because we might not have to make broad brush changes. We might be able to say, well, these are the specific types of patients that you've been denied access to. And so we've got to figure out a way for you to get that access um, in whatever are perceived to be uh, adequately safe environments. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into the, whatever it is, what, whatever we settle on is our, I'm not calling it our new normal. I'm calling it our new, you know, or equilibrium for the moment, you know, till we change the, w what we have to do next. Um, and for wilderness medicine, I think we should um, take that under consideration. Um, you know, we, uh, for a period of time, may be doing um, some um, virtual activities that previously would have been in person, and they could be uh, purely virtual. They could be hybrids, um, you know. And and you know, those are decisions that I'm sure will be made with a lot of of thought and consideration. We should look at what we're sacrificing and how can people um, how can people substitute for that one-on-one -on -one direct, you know, let me, let me hold your hands and guide you through tying this knot. Um, you know, let me show you how to make that stretcher. Um, let me, um, you know, have you um, listen to a simulation of somebody's heart sounds when they have high altitude pulmonary edema. So I, uh, it, it'll all work out, you know, we're just, and, you know, for those of you on the call who are trying to think of, you know, how do I get involved in, 
in the Wilderness Medical Society in the specialty, these are great opportunities um, to increase our knowledge. Um, and so, you know, be thinking about it. You don't have to be in an academic medical center to do this. You just have to be outside. Paul, so there's a, a question that was posted by one of our members that is it's multiple parts and it actually sums up multiple other questions that were placed. So I'm going to give this to you in its entirety and then break it up if you'd like me to. So can, uh, you, can sure. you speak to how wilderness medicine or simply spending time in the wild has given you resiliency both professionally and personally? I know that physician burnout and mental health is major concern, especially in light of the crisis of COVID and the trauma that has caused so many. How would you advise other physicians and medical professionals to seek support and joy together in the outdoors, wilderness, alongside training and education? And is there a way to make this wild joy more accessible and encouraged in our communities? Um, that's a, that's a great, it's a great observation um, because I think if you changed it from a question into a statement of what we ought to do, that the question is the answer. Um, how, what are the practical tips? Um, you know, learn, I meant what I said when I, everything I said, but the, you know, the, the savoring one thing a day, I, I don't think we're programmed necessarily to automatically um, seek joy um, in what we do. Um, you know, too many times now we're programmed to kind of get through the day. Um, and I think we've got to convert that getting through the day to uh, taking real joy out of what we do and, um, and finding something in the midst of any activity to, you know, just savor it. Just, you know, it's, it's almost a meditative process where you, you just, you know, you might hear a bird chirping that just, makes you relax and makes you realize that there's wonderful things happening. Um, just tune everything else out if you can. Um, and just listen to that bird for 30 seconds and just don't think of anything else or even think about that bird. Just put yourself in a position to be uh, meditative and take joy out of what you, um, you know, what, what you're observing in your life. And once you can do that, once you have the process down, um, then apply it in a wilderness setting. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think a great teaching tool is, you know, you could be out um, showing people how to make a, a snow cave and how to survive an unexpected night outdoors. Um, it, I, I guarantee you that in the time that you're out there doing that, you're going to encounter uh, incredible beauty. I mean, you're going to be in an environment that's terrific. And, um, you know, even if, if what you save for is the fact that you got the first block down in the right place, um, you can, you can just pause everybody and say, let's just, let's just think about what we just did. Let's think about where we are. Um, you know, that this, this is miraculous. This is medicine. Um, that this is, this is our passion. And uh, so just develop those skills. And I think you'll all be able to do it. And those skills didn't come to me early in life. I mean, I'm, I'm working on this stuff really hard now. Um, because um, that's what I, I that's the part that I neglected because I was always just working so hard. Thank you, Paul. And I'm going to kind of combine a couple of questions right now, two of them, and then I think we might be out of time. However, those of you who have posted questions and we haven't gotten to them, I'm, I'm hoping that Paul will give me the opportunity to speak with him later and we, perhaps we can answer them in the magazine. So, what do you see as the three best things that we in wilderness medicine can do for medicine in general? How can we go forward and progress as a society and as a specialty? 
And then finally, a question that's directed specifically to yourself. How have you used your experience in wilderness medicine to help yourself through what you're going through at the moment and to heal yourself? Um, let's see. Um, start with the first one again for me, Jen. So with wilderness medicine, what are the, the three things that you think that we can do as a society and as practitioners of wilderness medicine to help medicine as a whole? Um, well, um, these are going to be tactical. Um, get to know each other. Um, get to learn um, about all the wonderful people that are, are part of this organization um, and um, take the time to understand their points of view um, because you're going to find that you're going to um, feed off each other in terms of generating ideas and friendships and activities. Um, and so to the extent that you can um, socially undistance without putting yourself at physical risk, um, do that. Um, and I think this meeting is a great opportunity to try and spot some folks and say, hey, let's talk when this meeting's over. I live near you, you know, let's just go have lunch and get outside and brainstorm about life in general. Um, and then once you, um, once you, uh, do that, um, then, um, be active, you know, find, find something to do, um, and, and do it. You'll feel good about it. Um, and, um, uh, that, you know, that's, what's going to keep wilderness medicine, uh, going. And what I tell people, if you, if you just can't think of anything else to do, um, go teach, um, and, and find a community group that would like to have some expertise. It can be a scouting group. It can be a rotary club. It can be any organization in your community that can be better prepared uh, to do the fun things in life. So, you know, don't, don't scare them away, but say, you know, winter's coming, you know, you're all going to be driving up to the Sierras and slipping and sliding and you might get stuck in a little avalanche and be in your car. Here's, here's what you do. Um, and, and just get out and teach. Um, uh, and I think what you'll find is that you'll, you'll be in great demand. You know, the floodgates will, will open because it's interesting stuff and people, um, gravitate to people that know what they're talking about. Um, all right. Number two, Jen. Have you been able to use your experience in the wilderness and wilderness medicine to help yourself through your own personal medical challenges right now? Well, um, I'm just learning, you know, so I'm five weeks into this right now. Uh, it, it wasn't expected. And, you know, so I'm just learning to deal with it. And I'm, uh, I'm truly, uh, most I'm concerned about my family and my friends and the things that, um, I want to get done. Um, so, um, I would say that, uh, the, it's the, it's not so much that it's taught me survival techniques because, um, uh, they're not directly applicable to my situation. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if I could get an extra, um, week of life for every fish hook I've taken out of myself, then I would say that that would have been a, a direct, a direct benefit. But the, you know, it's really the, just the fact that I have this anchor and I don't mean a bad anchor. I mean, one that I can tie off to and float around the buoy and, and stay in the water. It's, it's this, um, it's this bond to my friends in wilderness medicine and, to the whole concept of doing what we're talking about, um, that's going to sustain me um, through some of the 
the tough times. And I mean, just to give you an example, you know, um, I'd still be in bed right now. Um, if, if it wasn't for the fact that I was here talking to you guys, I mean, it's just so how good is that? Right. I mean, I, you know, I have something to live for. I mean, of course I have my family and of course I have my friends and, um, but from a professional side, uh, uh, I meant what I said, you know, um, you know, I, I have you guys. And so to the extent that I can maintain some normal semblance of daily activities, uh, that's what I intend to do, you know, until the time that I say, you know, you guys got it and, uh, and you're pretty close. Um, so uh, that, that's how I'd answer that. Paul, thank you so much for taking your morning and sharing this with us and sharing your experiences. I appreciate you for opening the, the conference and for helping all of us along our, our own pathway right now. I am going to turn this over to Renita and she will talk to us about the, the break and the breakout rooms that we're going to have. And everybody keep your thoughts going to, to Paul and I'll copy the chats. So, yeah. And, and just anybody that needs my help um, on anything, you have an idea you want to talk about, you think I can get you to somebody that can help you. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to try and help. And if I can't keep up with you, then, you know, you can cut me loose. But the, I, I, um, I want to help. Uh, I've always wanted to help. And so uh, I don't anticipate changing that. Um, in any way, uh, shape or form and, and uh, find ways that you can help. Cause I can, you know, I think you guys are all like me a little bit and at least, and uh, when you come to this juncture in life and you have to face these sorts of decisions, it'll be, it'll be looking back on the people that you helped uh, and who appreciated what you were able to do for them. That that's, it's going to give you some peace.